my feeling about what's going on now with a lot of the polarization we see and the people living in these silos of like with like, a lot of it is that it, because it works from a marketing point of view to segment people into market segments and sell them stuff they're going to want to buy, all these different media channels appeal, basically they're collecting advertising demographics to sell products to. I, look, uh, democracy is not supposed to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's, it, it's supposed to be about a broadness of ideas. But this is a self-fulfilling prophecy of if I'm only rewarded for doing base actions as an elected official, then obviously my communications and my outreach is going to be very specific in a certain way over and over and over again. The more I continue to only speak to one group, the more other people continue to feel alienated, the more people don't actually feel like they belong to a political party, which is why the fastest growing party throughout the entire country is a decline to state or independent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only people that are left in those parties are the most extreme of those parties. It's really actually not that hard to see the connection between how these things go. Uh, but it takes, I mean, I think, it, I think that a lot of it, uh, you could put it on elected officials. I'm totally fine with that. I actually think, though, that if an electorate stood up, money would be irrelevant in politics if everybody's voted, right? I mean, if you saw, I mean, it's true. <laughs> if you saw, this is one of the things that I tell young people. I said that, look, if you literally showed up for two cycles, we only, vote, we only target likely voters two and four, three and four of the last elections. I mean, this is all done through data. If I saw demographically that all of a sudden I was 25 to 35 year olds or 25 to 40 year olds, my messaging would shift, right? I mean, it just would. But it doesn't cost anything to vote, but people aren't participating in the same way. Even, even in this election, you had, what, a 55 or whatever percent national turnout in one of the most consequential elections in, literally, in history. Uh, so I, you can take the money out of the politics simply through participation regularly, not once every four years and once every eight years because you got mad or you got behind somebody you believe in. At the local level, when there's a local ballot initiative, you need to show up on those roles. You show up, it'll actually, in my, my opinion, totally transform the way that elected officials will interact with, with voters and actually help shift the messaging and be much more informed in the way that we do things. And that, I actually wanted to raise the question of civics. Just simple civics education in our schools, or maybe we learn it from our parents and families. And, and Adrian, I'd like to ask you, as someone who obviously grew up and has a great career in the public, the private sector rather going, but volunteered to get involved in local political campaigns, where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me it came from this upbringing of, you know, understanding just how lucky I was. You know, I, I could look, I have, a million cousins, um, every one of whom I think is just as smart as I am, um, but their life outcomes are drastically different, and it's just like they were born to a different sibling in the family. And for me, I always felt that responsibility. I mean, it sounds cliche, but to whom much is given, much is expected. And I felt, you know, to the extent that there were candidates that I believed in or issues that I cared about, I wanted to be involved because I, I could be. I didn't have to work three jobs. I had the time to do it, and so I should. It's, it's expected of me. I think that's true of, of everybody. That's just always the way I felt did about it. Did you learn it. that from your parents? Um, I did, and I, I didn't. You know, I remember it, was, it must have been, you know, 90 or 92 campaign, and there was some, you know, maybe it was like a Willie Horton thing, and I remember being a child and sort of being upset about it. My parents, who were both African-American, like, seemed sort of, blase about it. and I was like, oh, like, hello, you guys should be angry about this. This is really um, racist. And I remember my parents saying, like, honey, we were black at Harvard in the 70s. We're done. Like, we've made our contribution. <laughs> That's it. We're tired. Um, but, but they, I mean, they were always were sort of politically engaged, if not active. And then my mother did at some point run for school board in our, our little town in Massachusetts where I grew up. So, I, you know, it did come from them. And they were always, you know, they always paid attention to issues and talked about things at the table. But I think they ingrained in me that a lot was expected of me because I had been given a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Was it like that for you, Zach? Uh, my, my, definitely, you? definitely. My parents, uh, exact opposite people. My mom, I was mentioning from the Midwest, and uh, again, first on that, to go to college, my dad. Uh, my grandfather was an economic advisor to a president. My father went to medical school. They're totally opposite worlds, and they met at the University of Minnesota, where my mom was a, a nurse at the time uh, when she'd gone back to school. But 
he used to take me out to uh, Native American reservations outside of San Diego. Uh, he would provide a lot of free medical care. And one of the things he would do is take me out there and say, the difference between you and them is really nothing. You need to recognize this. Or he would take me into the hospital with him all the time. <laughs> yeah. And he always worked in the inner city locations in San Diego and said, without health, you have nothing, nothing at all. But secondly, the reason that you're not here is just by chance. Everything's arbitrary. Everything's by chance. You have a responsibility to give back in a way. And they did it by example. They did it by making hard choices. Uh, there is, there is, let me tell you something, based on the last statements I was talking about, the interactions with elected officials, there is nothing more rewarding than this job. There's nothing more rewarding than public service. Because some people wonder when they go to work every day whether they're actually doing something that impacts the trajectory of the world. And I don't wonder that about Congressman Farr. He, in, he impacted not just the trajectory of this community, but the world was the decisions that you made and the, and the leadership that you had. And a lot of people 10 or 15 years from now may not know his name, but the impacts will be forever. That's what public service should be about and the commonality of stuff. And the rewarding, it's so rewarding to do it that I, I don't understand why more people don't want to do it uh, to have that sense. But I, I agree now that I have my own child, I'm gonna do the exact same thing with him and, and make sure that he understands that he's been given a lot of gifts that, that nobody else would have. And he has a responsibility to ensure that there's an equality of opportunity for those other kids that weren't born into the same situation. Well, Spencer, for me, it was easy as, uh, speaking of names, I just, if I learned that if you uh, are born into a family with a great political name, use it. <laughs> <laughs> no, my mother was very active in the community and very, very progressive and always um, got me to volunteer and do, you know, sort of clean up things, and um, I just loved sort of the participating in something greater than myself. Well, it's, you know, my dad uh, was a civil rights activist in Bermuda in the 1950s, uh, which was a pretty unusual thing for a college-educated young white man to be doing in Bermuda in the 1950s. It was a segregated society until the late 60s. And uh, I guess I had a similar kind of inspiration, uh, this example of somebody who saw things that he thought were wrong and worked to make them better. It's an extraordinary paradox, right? The best way to make yourself happy and to be fulfilled is to do things for other people, is to commit yourself to a cause greater than yourself, right? And, but it's, it's sort of hard to rationalize, right? Because you're like, I'm, how am I going to get if I'm giving away? But mm. it really is the way that it works. And I, you know, I mean, I, frankly, I mean, I can't wait for my next opportunity to serve.